Hello, that's better. Okay, all right, all right, good. I'm gonna start over. Uh, hello and welcome to my February live stream. I'm glad you could make it today. In case you don't know who I am, I'm Andy Ward. This is my channel, Andy Ward's Ancient Pottery. This is the best place on the internet to learn about primitive and replica pottery making. So the reason it's called ancient pottery is we're not just making your typical run-of-the-mill pottery. We're trying to recreate pottery as it was hundreds or even thousands of years ago. So the kind of technology we're talking about is uh, old technology for making pottery. Not that it's not still usable today. And the subject that I'm going to be talking about today is tools. And so I've got collected around me a whole bunch of the tools that I use to make primitive and replica pottery. And we're going to be playing a little bit of like show and tell today. We're going to be showing you what I use and talking about where you can acquire these kind of tools or where, how you can make your own, that sort of thing. Okay. So the subject is tools and ancient pottery. But most importantly, I'm answering your pottery related questions. So if you have a question related to pottery at all, just ask it in the chat and I will try to answer them all before the end of the uh, live stream, okay? I apologize for the audio. I really don't know what happened because um, it was showing up on the screen like the microphone was connected, but nothing was coming through. And so it's, uh, it was obviously a software issue. Uh, so anyways, uh, let me get to the uh, announcements I have for today before I get started on uh, the live stream and talking about my tools. Um, I'm going to be doing a pottery kit giveaway on my March live stream. Okay, so I'm going to give away um, a basket with everything in it, you know, gourd scraper, pookie, all the stuff. And I'll, and I'll go through that as we go through the live stream today. But just so you know, on my March live stream, which is scheduled for March 9th, okay, uh, we're going to be here on this channel, March 9th, same time. So we'll do it like 11 o'clock mountain time. And whatever that comes out where you're at, uh, it'll be the same time, but it'll be a Saturday instead of a Sunday. Uh, I'm going to have a live stream and I will give away at the end of that live stream um, a whole kit. Now, in order to be eligible, you have to be in the United States because I have to be able to ship it to you. Right. Other than that, if you're on the live stream, you can apply and be in the drawing for this pottery kit. So if you're interested, especially if you're just starting out with uh, primitive pottery, this would be a great opportunity for you. Um, my Southwest Potter's Gathering, which this will be the second annual. I had one last year. <clears throat> that will be April 5th, 6th, and 7th. So that's coming up in just a little over a month. And what that is, is last year it was mostly firing pottery. This year we're going to focus on uh, some field trips. So we're going to meet out at my property. I have 40 acres out in the country. And we're going to be talking about pottery. But mostly we're going to be going out and exploring. So we're going to go look at, on the first day, on the 5th, which is Friday, we're going to be going out looking at some ruins and looking at some collections of ancient pottery. On the 6th, that Saturday, we're going to be going out and collecting clay at a bunch of locations. So we'll be traveling around uh, Southeast Arizona and collecting clay different places. And then the last day, on the 7th, on Sunday, we're gonna go collect um, some minerals, pigment minerals from some old mines. So in each day, we're gonna be traveling. And so if you're not, you're welcome to come camp with us at the property, but if you're not a camping person or if you're only interested in one or two days, you could stay in Tucson or at a hotel or come from wherever you live and meet us somewhere along the way as well. Now, this event is open to uh, supporters of the channel. So people that are channel members, patrons, and, uh, and Ancient Potter Club members. So if you're not one of those and you want to attend, all you have to do is just join like the Ancient Potters Club or, or you can just join as a, as a channel member, which is easy. There should be a link right here in YouTube at the bottom. Click the join button. You can join us and then come out there and, and participate in the events. So if you're interested in that. Uh, the other thing, don't forget to hit the like button. That's going to help me with the algorithm, the YouTube algorithm on this. And finally, my pottery workshop. Uh, my workshop is the 28th, March 29th through April 2nd. So it's a five-day intensive pottery workshop out at my property. Um, and this has been full for months, but I just had two people drop out. So there are two openings in there as of right now. So... If you are interested in that workshop or if you were somebody that was interested before and it was full, there are two openings. And because it's less than a month away, uh, the only option is to pay in full, right? You can't just put a deposit down because it, it's coming up pretty soon. So uh, the pay in full option is open if you're interested in that workshop, okay? Uh, we're going to look at the chat and then I'll get right into the, uh, the tools, okay? Make sure I cover all the chat. Now here's all the people telling me my audio was broken, which um, I apologize. It was a software issue. Let's celebrate their 20th super on a live stream. Hmm, I don't know what that means. 
Uh, Philip Fisher gave me uh, four ninety nine. I appreciate uh, I appreciate that very much, Philip. Uh, is there a pottery kit to get started? Do you recommend? Um, yeah, I don't know of anybody that sells a pottery kit. Like I said, I'm giving one away. But if you're if you're just starting yourself and you have to collect it, you have to collect it from a number of places because there's nobody that just sells everything you need. Um, I sell some things. Some people sell others. I'll be covering that as we go forward. Um, Dablin Dawn is here. Good to see you. Uh, let's see, I'm just scrolling down through the chats to make sure I didn't miss anything. Any questions? Granny Goose, Arizona sometimes seems like a million miles away. You know, Granny, I, you're only, uh, what, like Bakersfield area? It's not that far. I mean, it depends on your situation, obviously. But um, I'm going out to California in June. So, um... You know, I make my way out that way once in a while. Would a coconut shell make a good scraper? Yeah. So, uh, no, no one nowhere asked about coconut shells. Um, for gourd scrapers, um, I usually use, you know, a gourd. These are not too hard to come by in the United States, but I know a lot of people that have watched my channel that live in Europe have trouble getting gourds. I don't. They're pretty common for craft activities here in the states, but I think maybe in Europe they're not so much. Uh, and so coconut shells are a great alternative. People have trouble getting their hands on gourds. And in the doobly-doo right now, I have a link to the Wurtz Gourd Farm here in Arizona, and they will ship gourds. So if you don't have gourds in your area, you could always order a gourd over the internet. Okay, um, I'm going to get right into the content then. Uh, move my notes out of the way here and change the camera. There we go. So this is this is the basket. Mm, how do I get it on? The, oh, I got to move that's better. Uh, it's so hard because everything's flipped, kind of mirror flipped on the screen that it's, it's hard to, um, to center things on the screen because it always is the opposite direction than you think it is. Uh, so when I was down in Mexico last month, um, I found these, these baskets and these are perfect for keeping your pottery stuff in, see? So I bought two of these to use for kits that I'll give away to people. So here is... This is my kit, and it's not its not really full of everything right now because I haven't been any place recently, but my parents back in, oh gosh, like 2005, they traveled down to Chihuahua and did that. There's a train that goes across Copper Canyon down there, um, and it, it's really awesome, but it, while they were down there, I asked them to pick me up one of these big lidded Tarahumara baskets with the idea that I would use it for my pottery kit. So this has been my traveling pottery kit basket since you know, 2005, so a long time. And it's held up well, and it's still in good shape. It's not damaged or anything. And you can see there's a, there's even like a pattern woven into the side. It used to be more, uh, it used to be easier to see because these were slightly different colors. But over the years, they've all faded to kind of, you know, straw colored. But it's a great basket to keep it in. Actually, it's a little bit big. I have more room here than I need. So these ones I picked up when I was in Chihuahua last month are actually a, a better size. So this is the one I'm giving away, and I'll show you what I have in here. See that? You're getting it centered on the... That's weird. So um, this one is probably not quite... It's a, little, it's a little smaller than mine, which, like I said, is a good size, but it's also maybe not quite as finely woven. Um, so here's the, here's the main things that I think somebody getting started would need. I, this is what I put in here, and this is what will come with the kit um, when, I, when I give it away next month. So I just made this. This is a good cutting tool. So if you if you're interested in, you know, traditional uh, ceramics, you know, like studio ceramics, then they use something called a needle tool. I'm looking for mine right now and I can't find it. I've got one here. <sighs> Unbelievable. You know how it is when you want something you can never find it. I just saw it this morning. I know it's here. Here it is. Good Lord. Okay. So they use, uh, in ceramics, they use needle tools a lot. And basically it's just for cutting, you know, like trimming rims or cutting uh, like holes in the pot or whatever. It's a really great cutting tool for a pot, for clay, for damp clay. And if you saw my Mata Ortiz video, they use hypodermic needles a lot down there, which is essentially the same thing. It's just a sharp point for cutting. Uh, now I've made these, uh, this is like a primitive needle tool. This is a mesquite thorn that is just glued into a, a stick. And it works really good. And so I've got one here that I've been using for 
a couple of years. There's a video. I made this on a YouTube video probably two years back now. And I've been using it ever since then, and it, it's held up real fine. Now, you can see that the point, this is the one I just made for the kit. The point isn't quite as sharp anymore, but it, it's, re, it's good. It's definitely still usable. I made one out of mesquite and one out of a saguaro thorn, and the saguaro broke pretty soon. And the mesquite just holds up. It's much more durable, obviously. So that's what I've made for the kit here, is a primitive needle tool. And um, what else do I have? I have a gourd scraper. And these are just, just a piece of gourd. And this is good for shaping your pot. If you watch any of my videos where I'm building pottery, I use that. But this is just a gourd. And I just use a, a saw, just a, a hand saw. And I'll cut it into chunks. So I'll have like a square like this big. And then um, a rasp works really good for just quickly shaping it. Now I had a, I also have a belt sander, which does, does it really fast. But it also puts a lot of that into the air. So you have to be careful you don't breathe it. Uh, now this is a, a gourd, I mean this is a rib, this is like a deer rib bone, so it has a nice sharp edge, it's good for scraping the pot, scraping it smooth while you're making it. <clears throat> this is something that I use, this is, you know, the one I use in my kit right here. A uh, little piece of buckskin, these are great for smoothing rims. Again, if you watched any of my videos where I'm forming pots, you'll see me use these things. So you just get it wet, <clears throat> put the buckskin in the water for a 15 or 20 minutes before you use it, and you can just kind of drag it along the rim and it's really great for smoothing it. Uh, this is a polishing stone. This is one is quartz. There's a quartz polishing stone. Uh, and then a, a yucca brush. So this is a, a paintbrush made out of a yucca leaf. Uh, what else do I have in here? Oh, a pookie. Now this is something I never sell. I never sell pookies because there's a lot of work involved in a pookie and I don't think I could sell them for a reasonable price. Um, but for this one time, for making this kit, it's not complete without a pookie. So I'm um, giving away one of my pookies. This has been used. You can see some use wear on it. And um, a water bowl. You have to have a water bowl. This is a water bowl I actually made in a video. And it's been used quite a bit. As you can see, it's got some um, calcium deposits on the outside. But it's still very usable. So I'm giving away the water bowl. I will also put in here, it's not here now. Everything's here except this. And that is a lump of... Uh, reddish brown clay from locally and I'll put that in there wrapped up in plastic of course <clears throat> and then I'll also send it with this chunk of white clay so this is some white clay from near Benson Arizona so once you make the pot out of that reddish brown clay you can decorate it with the white clay so that's the that's the the kit the pottery kit that I'll be giving away on March 9th and that's just going to be a random draw uh, here on this live stream so um we'll just We'll just go through the live stream. I'll ask you to put in a specific, like a, um, like a, um, what do they call it? a hashtag, right? I'll, I'll, I'll tell you a specific hashtag that you will comment in the, in the chat. And then at the end of the live stream, I will do a random draw of everybody that submitted that hashtag and we'll just pick a winner. Now, again, you have to live in the United States because I have to be able to mail that, okay? So that's the kit I'm giving away. Let me go back to the chat and make sure we haven't got anything. Uh, are you able to plan your pottery meetup lots of time ahead? I would love to travel from Ireland. Um, well, I, I announced that originally back, I don't know, like October maybe. So um, it, I, usually, I usually plan my events about six months in advance. So uh, if you keep track of what I'm doing, and my, my email newsletter is probably the best way to do that, then you certainly could plan ahead to travel from a long distance like Ireland. Great for tortillas. What's great for tortillas? I don't get it. Um, gourd scrapers work good for shaping pottery. Shirred scrapers work good for surfacing the pot. Um, I've used both. Uh, I think the gourd works for both, but a lot of it just depends on, you know, what you're used to. Uh, pookies were fairly easy to make. Pookies, pookies are fairly easy to make, but <clears throat> um, a lot of people don't want to go through the effort. of. It's just like the gourd scrapers. Like, I stopped... I stopped carrying them on my website a while back, and I had a friend who was making them and sending them to me, but um, we've been out for a while. A lot of people want to buy gourd scrapers, and it, it's real easy to make your own, but some people just, they just rather buy one, you know, and it's like yucca leaves, right? I sell yucca leaves to make brushes out of on my website, and when I first put them on there, I thought, well... This is for people that live, say, on the East Coast or something. They want to try a yucca leaf brush. Certainly nobody who lives in the Southwest will buy yucca leaves because they grow everywhere. I have sold more yucca leaves to people who live in places like Nevada or 
New Mexico or California or Texas, people that are live in an area where there are yucca plants, some people would just rather buy, I think. I, and I don't understand. <clears throat> and N Doghouse says that train would be Chihuahua uh, Pacifico. Many awesome tunnels and bridges took me to Las Mochis, Sinaloa. That was about 50 years ago, but it still operates. Copper Canyon is indescribable. Yeah, that's an awesome trip. I'd love to, I think it'd be an awesome trip to make and make a video about even sometime, but I've never been on it. Um, it's a basket of holy things, <laughs> Granny. Um, I need to put some more patience in my toolkit. Yeah, it's, it's easy to get, you know, rushed and kind of throw some stuff together, and that's okay too, but uh, it's nice to take some time and kind of think it out too. Is there a particular type of stone that polishes better than others? Are you using quartz, or would other stone types work? Granite. Oh, yeah, as long as it's hard and smooth. That's all that matters. So on my website, I've been selling those quartz ones this year, but I'm just about out of those, so I don't think they're on my website anymore. I've still got the fluorite ones. I've had those for years, and the fluorite works really good. That's also a very hard stone, and they're, they're lapidary stones. They've been tumbled, you know, in a rock polisher, so they're really nice. And the new ones that I just got at the gem show um, are these, and they're called Carnelian, C-A-R-N-E-L-I-A-N, Carnelian, and they're, they're beautiful stones, you can see. So these are the ones that I just, they're recently up on my website. Um, so yeah, it doesn't matter what kind, but what you want is, you want something that's relatively big enough that you can grip it real good. Like sometimes you'll get really tiny stones and you know, it gives me a hand cramp to try to hold something like that for a long time while I'm polishing. So a decent sized rock and then a nice, you know, smooth edge, nice and rounded like that is what I prefer. But hard, as long as it's hard. Um, let's see, that was, um, it's, don't lend your pookie to anyone. I lent some to a student who still has his pot in it. Never give it back. <laughs> yeah, yeah, for sure. Um, someone's going to be very happy. Yeah, someone is going to be happy, hopefully. Do you know if there is any clay in northern Illinois? I have no idea where to look. Um, I don't have much experience with northern Illinois myself, but that's all like glacial deposits in there, isn't it? I would think that would be a good place to look for glacial clay, but I mean, I don't know. I don't, I don't really know. I have any experience with northern Illinois. There's very few places on earth that don't have clay available in one way or another. Uh, Dablin Dawn says, I bought a pookie from New Mexico clay. It has the wonky built into it. It's oblongish and has a flat spot. On. Oh, that's too bad. I See, I've never bought their uh, their pookies at New Mexico clay, but I often recommend it to people because people come to me and say, where can I get a pookie? And I don't, I just don't sell them because there's, I put a lot of time in a pookie. So you definitely want one that's, you know, round and, and fairly symmetrical. So that's too bad that it came wonky because I do recommend those. Uh, it's the only place I know of where you can buy pookies is New Mexico clay. And the link to that is down in the doobly-doo as well. So if you are interested in buying a pookie. Um, the cookies that I make have always seem to warp. They never seem to have a nice, perfect concave shape. I'm sure you mean pookies, yeah. Um, you got to make them on something. So if you've got a, another pot, you know, a bowl, something that's rounded that you can drape the uh, the clay over. So what I do, and, it, and I have a free how to make a pookie lesson that you can get if you subscribe to my newsletter. Just go to my website, and the website is, uh, let's see, it's on here somewhere, ancientpottery.house. If you go to my website, uh, you can subscribe to my newsletter. If you subscribe to the newsletter, then you get a coupon for this free lesson that you can purchase, and it's a video-based lesson. But um, basically what I do is I just roll out a slab of clay, I use something to cut a complete, uh, an exact circle. So I'll go in the kitchen and like get a bowl or something that's round. And I place that over it and cut around it so I have a right, uh, you know, a perfect circle. And then I get something that's rounded, a, a bowl or a pot or it could be a lot of things um, that, that have that rounded shape you want. And then you just drape it over it. And see, once you have that clay, that circle of smooth, damp clay, then you can just use your gourd scraper just... Press it down all the way around and then let it dry a little bit and then you can just gently lift it off and set it on a piece of cloth or something to dry. And that's a good way to make a nice, even pookie that's relatively symmetrical. A little bit of wonk is okay though. I mean, the prehistoric pottery was all wonky. 
Uh, I seem to have trouble with ridge forming at edge of Pookie. Oh yeah, well that's a real problem. Um, yeah, um, you you see me deal with that in, in my videos where I'm forming pots a lot. Or if you, if you watch that recent Mata Ortiz video, there's a scene of him in there dealing with that Pookie edge. So you often get a little lip or a little indentation right at the edge of the Pookie. And so once you get the pot, once the pot is firmed up, you can get it out of there, you've got to use a scraping tool. So we'll talk about scraping tools now because it's a good um, segue into that. Um, so you need to scrape the pot. And that was one of the things that, remember I talked about the deer rib bone. That's what that's good for because it has a nice sharp edge. Scrape the pot while it's still, you know, leather hard. Firm enough that you can handle it without bending it out of shape, but also soft enough that you can scrape. And scrape down the high points. Uh, I, I usually use the deer rib. This is a piece of cane, just like river cane, that I've split. And those work real good for the scraping as well. And, um over here uh, like an old credit card or like a you know um, uh, a store credit card or not a credit card but what is it like a um, like a gift card like a store gift card or something like that and you know that's a nice sharp edge that you can use to scrape the pot as well you can use a lot of things for that I have this big wide uh, deer rib here that's kind of sawed off on two ends and it has a real sharp edge and that works just like the credit cards for scraping so scrape it down as best you can, you know, without scraping it too thin and weakening it. And then you're just going to get little balls of damp clay and press them into that hole and press and press and press. Get little damp clay all through any place that's an indent and then let that firm up a little bit and then go back over and kind of scrape that all smooth. And it'll be just as smooth as glass when you're done. It takes a little bit of time. It's not super difficult though. Uh, that was uh, Sarah Mayhew who asked that question. Yeah, Sarah, and, and I show how to do that in some of my videos here on YouTube where I'm making a pot. Um, I have one that's supposed to come out next week. For, I don't know, back here. Anyways, this little pot I'm working on, but I don't know if I'm going to get it done. The weather's really great today, but uh, it's supposed to get nasty tomorrow, and if it gets nasty, I'm not going to be able to fire the pot, which means I'm not going to get the video done by Wednesday. So we'll see. I made a scraper out of ceramics. I rounded the end so it would not leave any marks. I left the scraper in bisque form and it works. Oh yeah, yeah, absolutely. So I've got some of those here. Um, so in the in the ancient Southwest, a lot of people used um, gourd scrapers, but a lot of people also used ceramic scrapers. They would just take an old, they lived in a world where broken pottery was everywhere, right? They used pottery every day and they broke a lot of pottery. And so they could just go out to the trash dump and look through it till they found a nice piece of pottery. And they just shape it, just scrape it down to whatever shape they want. And like Mark was saying, he uses this for, I don't know, scraping the outside of the pot or something. And, and these work good. I've got a couple of these from different shapes. I've got some other ones in here too. Um, so that that's a good way to kind of scrape the pot. And sometimes you even find them you know, in archeological sites that are almost shaped like a gourd scraper, kind of very rounded, like they were using it to push out the, the form of the pot. Uh, here's another. Uh, ceramic scraper that I have. Another thing that works good sometimes is if you got, if you can just find stones in different shapes. So this is a nice kind of a long stone. Um, you can get different sh stones in all different shapes and you can use that for scraping the outside of the pot or pressing in, you know, places. All useful for smoothing the pot before it's done. So, where was I at? Those stones are really beautiful, lovely kit, by the way. Thank you from Mark. Love those stones. Just got a batch tumbled. Do you have your own tumbler, Mark? Nice to have a pointed edge on a pointed stone to get into small places. That's for sure. Yeah, so you want you probably want some polishing stones in different shapes because um, they're good for different things. Like I've got this one, and it's got a pretty decent little point on it um, on the end. And it, it's fairly sharp around here, too, for getting in, like, under rims and stuff. And so, and, and like I said, I have this long one here. This is great for inside of rims or down inside of pots and stuff. Lots of different shapes are, are also good and useful. Granny Goose, what I was trying to say is that I never seem to get a nice shape to my pookie in the end. Kind of warped. Um, well... Uh, a lot of that has to do with your clay. Like different clays will warp more than others. So some clays that have a lot of warpage factor to them may, they start out perfect and then warp as they dry. So maybe that's what's going on with yours is they're warping as they dry. And there's, there's not much you can do about that other than maybe find a better clay. Um, 
Your how to make a pookie lesson is great. I appreciate that, Cosmic Algae. I live next to a river in northern New Mexico. The ground is almost unfreezing. The center of my river is sand sides or mushy mud. Is that okay to harvest? I don't, yeah, it's hard to say, uh, you know, with just your description, but definitely worth a try. You know, get out there and see what you got. Dig a little up. Why, if you don't scrape the, what if you don't scrape the pot? I never seem to have needed it as smooth with a hard stone tool, usually would. Yeah, you know, whatever works for you, right? Um, it, different people work different. And I know, you know, when I teach a workshop, I can have 12 students and everyone will come out with different results in the end. Some people kind of keep their pot very smooth as they work. And some people are kind of rough and they, you know, they have a pretty rough surface on the outside. Usually, in my experience, the way I work, um, once I'm done with the pot, um, it's not really ready for polishing or, or slipping until I've done a little bit of, you know, cleaning up the outside. And that's what I'm talking about. But with, but depends. It depends on the person and it depends on your clay. So, I mean, there's no, as I always say, there's no right and wrong answers in pottery. There's, there's a million different ways to do it. And there's what works good for you. And all I can teach is what works good for me, which may not be the same as what works for you. Uh... Fluffy Lavender, thank you for all your informative lessons. Oh, you're welcome. Angela, got to go picking up a load of manure for the garden. Have a great day. See ya, Angela. Have fun with your manure. Uh, hi, can you tell me why my clay mixed with sand? I mean, why it doesn't settle as it should? No, it should. But if your clay is, if you've mixed your clay up, let's say in a five-gallon bucket, and you're waiting for that sand to settle out and it's not, it could be that you've mixed it too thick, Right. So you don't want your, when you're doing that, when you're trying to purify clay through levigation, you know, mix it up with water and let it settle. You don't want it as thick as a milkshake because in a milkshake, some of that grit is going to remain suspended. You want it thin like milk so the, so the grit will fall to the bottom. So in some cases, I've mixed up my clay in a bucket and that grit just seems to suspend. And so what I'll do is I'll get a second bucket. I'll pour half of the clay into that second bucket and then I'll top them both off with water and mix them again, and then the grit will start to fall because I'm mixing it thinner. Don't You don't want it to be too thick. And that might be what's going on with you. It's just an idea. Mark Gibson, we had New Mexico seeks rocks tumbled them for us. We traded her a pot. Oh, that's a good way to do it. Um, Sarah, do you think that the ancient pottery makers got worried if their pots weren't perfect? You know, here's the thing. Like, the pots you see in a museum are the very, very finest pots that they have. They've got a basement full of thousands of pots, and they pick one out of every 200 to bring up and show in the museum. And so we kind of get a, an unrealistic expectation for how perfect pots should be. Or we live in a world where everything comes from a factory, and so we expect everything to be just as perfect as what we buy down at, you know, at the store. And, and they didn't live in that world. They lived in a world where everything was a little wonky and a little off and handmade, and, and that was okay. And if you ever get a chance to handle ancient pottery, to go in the back room of the museum and, and look at some of it, or, or to pick it up, that's a great experience because what it teaches you is that almost all their pottery was wonky. So then you're less maybe focused on perfection. I know some of you are perfectionists, and I'm not one of those. Uh, but... A lot of people that aren't perfectionists seem to put themselves down and think that it has to be perfect, and it, it's not. Most of that ancient pottery is very, very wonky, which is why I always say just go with the wonky. That's part of what makes primitive pottery um, enduring and lovable and, and uh, warm, is that it's handmade and has a little bit of that handmadeness to it. Uh, so go with it, definitely. When we did the kiln conference in Silver City, that was, what year was that? 2022, I think? Um, they, they took this back room, they put tables out all through there, and then they took pottery out of their collection and just sat it on the tables. And then they told everybody that was at the conference, come down and wander through this gallery and handle the pottery. And a lot of people were afraid to pick it up, but they were they serious. They said, pick it up, look at the pottery, touch it. And what a wonderful experience that was. Not just because you got to be close with this pottery. People that are trying to make ancient pottery it's very useful to look at it closely, to put it in your hands and touch it. Uh, but all of these people that were interested in making replicas, to be able to go through and handle the pottery, that is a, a wonderful experience. And in some cases, that's a once-in-a-lifetime experience for people. So um, that's what 
I think you know everybody needs to realize is that once you start looking at ancient pottery and handling it, you realize that it's all wonky, and it's okay if yours isn't perfect too. Uh, let's see, an idea: what you make a pookie, you may try to put a bag or uncooked rice in a sock and put it in the pookie. Um, yeah, that might work. I've never heard of that, but I, it certainly sounds reasonable, uh, Marcia. Okay. Let me go back to my um, to my stuff here. So we talked a little bit about talked a little bit about the kit. Let me show you. This is uh, this is the stuff that was in my um, my little cup here. So these are like vertical tools. So in here I have um, this is a dental pick. This is a great tool. Um, like I will use this to scribe. Like if I'm signing my name on a pot, I've got a, like a sharp sharp steel tip here. But a lot of times, you know, if you're just picking something really really delicate in a corner or something, trying to clean something up, that's good. And you've got kind of a flat edge over here. That's a handy tool. I honestly don't know when I've ever used this and I don't know what it is, but it's been in my kit for a long time. I've got some markers. I've got way too many Sharpies here. Look at that. Six Sharpies? That's ridiculous. And these are engine push rods. And if you saw that video of Mata Ortiz, that was my last video, you saw them using these to polish pots. So these are good for polishing. There's another Sharpie. Unbelievable. This is a neat little tool. This this comes with like standard, um, you know, uh, studio pottery kits often. Kind of sharp on one end and it's got a little bit of a, of a curve on the other. A lot of times I use this when I'm trying to clean up coil seams down inside of like a small neck or inside of a pot. Uh, so I can reach that little edge where it curves and just kind of blend those coil seams together. But this is a handy tool. Just a piece of wood shaped. Um, there's my needle tool, again, used for cutting soft clay. This is the same thing. This is just a primitive one made out of a thorn. Um, this is that piece of split cane. And there's the deer rib. Those do the same thing, scraping the outside of the pot. This is another one of those studio pottery tools. And I can't say that I've almost ever used it, but it's handy for, you know, cutting, trimming clay. Uh, I, just, I just don't use it very much. This is another one of those pottery tools that I almost never use. A couple of pencils. Um, this is actually a uh, a screwdriver for like a a small engine, like a like a chainsaw or a lawnmower engine. I don't know if I've ever used it with pottery. It might just have got put in there on accident. Oh, here you go. Here, this is what they use in Mata Ortiz. This is the uh, the hacksaw blade. Okay, and it's been uh, shaped to have a point on this end. A handy tool. Nice spoon for reaching down inside of pots, pushing things out, cleaning things up. Handy. This, this is used for book binding, I think. And it's bone. It's a bone tool. And it's got a nice polish on it. And what I mostly use it for is um, sometimes if you need to polish smooth clay in a hard-to-reach spot, you know, even if you have a stone that has a pretty sharp edge, sometimes the spot is too tight to get in there. And so I can carefully get this piece of bone in, inside of a really small spot or even the, the tip if I need to, because it's all polished bone and polished the pot. That's what that's for. This is an old um, paintbrush handle that doesn't have a brush on it. So I don't, another thing that probably shouldn't be there. Um, and then I have another cup over here and that's just, these are mostly commercial paintbrushes. And mostly, I mean, I do use these some, but um, also a lot for like when I do a workshop, I'll bring, and I don't usually need for myself this many brushes. But when I go to a workshop, I bring this and then there's a brush for everybody. <clears throat> now there are some yucca brushes in here. Here's a yucca brush. This is, um, this is a brush made from children's hair, such as they use in Mata Ortiz. I think I have a couple of hair brushes in here, actually. There's another one right there. Little Mata Ortiz type style hair brush. And then there's also these liner brushes. And these are really useful. See how fine those are and how long? That's really useful for painting those long lines. So even, I have thicker ones that are still fairly long, see? And so if you're, if you're pulling a line, you know, you can dip it in the, the paint and then you can just pull it and that makes a nice straight, even line. So I've got quite a few of these liner brushes in here. These are good. I get these at um, Hobby Lobby and uh, these are really nice, fairly thin, long liner brushes right here. X liner. Uh, and then this is a brush I use for slip. This is one I made myself. So this is yucca fiber. This is the fiber of, I don't know, four or five yucca leaves 
that are all tied together and then put into a piece of stick. And so I use this for slip, app, applying slip. So. And then uh, related to painting, again, uh, I've got a collection here of um, yucca brushes of all different sizes. And the thing about yucca brushes is, I mean, even though they're, they're the kind of things that you, you know, you make yourself, you don't use them just once. I use them, these last for years. And so you can see some are kind of stained with, because they've been used to paint red or black. And you can kind of see the pigments in the, the fiber. So this one is very red, even though it's been cleaned out, it's, the fibers are still quite red. But you can continue to use these for a long time. And then as you need maybe different brushes, you can get a scissor and you can trim them off shorter if you need. Or if you want a thinner brush, you can split it long ways into just a couple of fibers and make them as thin as you want. So these are handy. Also, if you, before you use them, you want to soak them and that'll soften up those fibers because they're quite stiff at first. But once they've been soaked, they're really supple. And then finally, related to paint, uh, is a palette. I have a lot of these stone palettes, which work really good for kind of mixing your paint on and mixing up your pigments. And then a, a nice stone, a little coarser stone, not a polishing stone, that you, um, you know, get the water on there and you mix it up with the water that way. Okay. Let's see, what do we got here? 11.39, we got lots of time. Let's see. Uh... Go back to the chat really quick and see where we're doing there. A little cooking and earthenware. Where did I last leave off? Uh, Marsha, that's a pretty darn cool idea. Love cooking and earthenware. I try very hard to embrace the wonkiness, says Granny Goose. <clears throat> oh, my palette knife? Tanya says it's a palette knife. Are we talking about this? Yeah, I don't know where I got it. That's the thing is I don't know how I even got in my kit. Um, yeah, like a palette knife for, for painters, huh? So, I don't, I don't think I've ever used it. I picked it up somewhere. Yard sale, maybe, even, for all I know. Uh, Dablin Dawn, should I be concerned that the... Okay, CU is, you're using, you're using, uh, you know, chemist words, and I'm not a chemist, so. CU is copper, and CO is ca 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 carbon? I don't know. Should I be concerned that the CUCO migrated to the surface after I painted on the black paint? I used two parts of manganese dioxide and two parts of copper carbonate. Oh, I see where you're going. Okay, copper carbonate. One part red clay slip and a dab of organic paint. I, I'm having trouble following you, Don. Um, you think the copper migrated to the surface after you painted it? I use two parts of manganese, two parts of copper, one part of red clay, and a dab of organic paint. Um, yeah, I, I've never, ever, ever had experience where I painted and then the colors moved around on me after I painted them. I do think you don't have enough clay in there. You're probably going to have trouble with. My concern would be that your clay is going to, your paint is going to be fugitive after you fire because there's not enough clay in it. The the recipe is usually one part copper, one part manganese, and one part clay, right? And you said two parts copper, two parts manganese, and one part clay. I think you have way too little clay in there, and that's just from my experience. Uh, palette knives can be used to make repeated indentation marks in the surface of pattern. Yeah, I can see it having a use. I just, I just don't, I don't think I've ever used it is the thing. So I'm, I'm kind of like questioning it being there, given that I, it's been there for years and I've never used it. Uh, it looks black when I painted it on with the yucca brush, but then turn a beautiful emerald green. Um, yeah, I wouldn't worry about it too much because both the copper carbonate and the manganese dioxide are, will turn black in an oxidizing fire. So as long as you're oxidizing, it, it probably doesn't matter too much whether you use all copper or all manganese or some mix thereof. My concern is that you don't have enough, you may not have enough clay. And that, again, that depends on your materials and your clay and maybe it'll work fine for you. But in my experience, uh, that's not enough clay from what I've done. Uh, Petra, what sanding of the pots at Mod Artis really makes them different from the ancient pots? Wouldn't think of doing that myself, but they use many industrial stuff as you've shown. Yeah, um, and the same goes for the pots down in the Pueblos in New Mexico. Most of that Pueblo pottery is sanded. So if you ever watch a video or read a book about like Maria Martinez, for example, um, 
she was heavy into the sandpaper and that's how she got that really beautiful like smooth as glass uh, polished surface the only way you're going to get that well pretty much is, is to sand it first so they sand it and then they polish it and that that's how they get that glossy glossy finish so it's the Mod Ortiz potters aren't the only ones doing it. what I'm saying is most of the native potters in the southwest also sand their pottery and that's really the big difference one of the biggest differences between what I do and what other southwestern potters do in that because I'm trying to stay true to the ancient form I avoid the sandpaper and therefore my process has to be a little different mixing clay with paper pulp um, no um, I know that you can buy clay that's mixed with paper pulp or other you know even like fiberglass sometimes any kind of fiber and and it'll I'm sure it'll work like temper like a like an organic temper uh, so traditionally here in this area um, some of the native peoples would temper with like manure for example and that's the same sort of thing it's just little fibers and so that's doing the same thing as tempering the trouble with I think paper pulp or any kind of organic temper is that when you fire your pottery then you're left with very very um, porous pottery not just porous but also a bit more fragile because all that organic material be it paper pulp or manure or whatever sawdust will burn away in the firing and leave you with voids in the pot not necessarily wrong depends on what you're doing with it whether that's actually useful or not okay I think we're caught up I'm gonna go back to the um, uh, show and tell over here and this is a basket I keep um, in my studio with just miscellaneous pottery tools <coughs> so I thought I would show you what I have in here so the piece of buckskin uh, and this is this is used for all kinds of things sometimes I'll use a little scrap of buckskin I have some smaller bits somewhere maybe they're in my my kit over here I'm looking for them hmm. okay I don't see them I've got some smaller bits of buckskin that I used to, to um, smooth rims of pots that I'm not seeing right now um, and this it can be used for that but it can also be used for uh, polishing the outside of the pot if you just want to give it a nice um, uh, buff polishing not necessarily super polished but smooth it uh, you can use that and you can see it's kind of stained with clay and stuff from that sort of thing that's handy uh, this is on the same line this is also a piece of animal hide this is rabbit fur and this can be used to ply slip and if you read some of the old accounts of, of uh, native potters in the southwest say at the time of European contact when people were first writing down how they were doing things a lot of times they would talk about applying slip with um, some hot some fur so that works good for that oh here it is so this is a piece of the leather that I often use for for rims so it's just a nice little small size that I could just wrap over a rim and just pull it along to smooth it well it's very damp and I get this wet first I soak it in the, the water bowl for a few minutes before I use it um, and then because I'm making replicas I'm often measuring the pots as I work. I need to make sure they're the right height or width or whatever. So I do have a, a tape measure in here. This is a little um, wire for cutting clay. This is usually, I use this more for like blocks. So if I buy a big, or if I have a big block of clay that I purchased or, or processed myself and I need to chop a chunk off, you know, just grab the wire and drag it through it. Those are commercial tools. You can buy these. Um, I've got some a lot of clay on this gourd scraper but there's a gourd scraper I usually clean them off when I'm done this could have been left over from a workshop or something because sometimes students will do that I usually don't but I have a few gourd scrapers in here they're all dirty huh? so different sizes now man I've got more gourd scrapers in here than I need I'll tell you the truth look at that this is one of those uh, metal ribs that will often come with a you know commercial pottery making kit and these are handy these are useful um, mostly for scraping like if you're scrape like I was talking about using the credit cards and stuff you're scraping the outside of the pot trying to smooth it these are really handy because they have a nice sharp edge and a little bit flexible so you can kind of bend it you know to a curve and I saw a few people using these in Mod Ortiz as well and there's another one of those so I have two of those um, and then the credit cards yeah I've got like a days in hotel room key this is like uh, store credit this is another thing that comes with you know commercial pottery kits you can buy these at 
Michaels or Hobby Lobby or anywhere. And I, I have used this very few times. I could see this being more useful, I think, if it was shaped more like the gourd scraper. So it's crossed my mind before that I could take this in and just, you know, with the, the sander and just kind of shape that a little more usefully. I think that would be great. Because that point is like, you get down inside of a pot with that point, you've got to be careful you don't gouge the pot and make a mess out of it. It makes me nervous. Uh, this is a, a stone knife. These are not, I don't make these, but a friend of mine who I, I do demonstrations for, he'll often give them to me. So I have, I don't know, two, three, four of these around. And they're great. If you're doing a demonstration, it's really impressive to pull this out and like trim your rim off or cut the hole for your handle or something with it. But to tell you the truth, um, I was just talking about this the other day. Uh, let me find my, my needle tool and I'll show you what I'm talking about. If I can find my needle tool. There's one in this kit here. I'll just steal it. Okay. So if you look at it from the side, right, look how thick that is. You try to cut a piece of clay like a rim or something with that, it's hard to do delicate work with it because that's a fairly thick piece of stone. You know, now look at the thinness of that needle tool in comparison. You see? You see what I'm talking about? The needle tool is going to cut much more precisely with a lot less messiness uh, because it's, it's way more thin. So the, the stone tool, is imp it looks cool when you pull it out and people go, oh, that's a cool knife. Oh, this is way more effective at making fine cuts. So here's um, another one of those uh, rib bone scrapers. Sponge, these, and again, it's the common, you know, like studio pottery tool. If you buy one of those pottery making kits, it'll come with one of these, one of these metal ribs, you know, just the, a needle tool, just the typical stuff, and a sponge. But a sponge is very useful for wetting a pot. You can use it to soak up excess water in the bottom of a pot if you've been flowing down in there. Um, it's used for smoothing. You can use it to smooth the rim or the outside while the clay is damp. It is a useful tool. I saw these uh, sponges used a lot in Mata Ortiz as well. There's a piece of buckskin. Um, now we're getting down to the bottom. There's another piece of um, rabbit fur. No, no, this is the this is the beaver fur. The rabbit fur was the other one. So my friend Mott's found a, an old beaver coat or something and he cut it up and gave little bits to all of his potter friends. So beaver fur works really good because it's it's really dense and it repels water. I'm getting down to the bottom. Most of the bottom here is rocks of different sizes and shapes. Polishing stones, smoothing stones. I've got a lot of rocks down here. A couple of these are actual um, artifacts. They're actually old polishing stones from ruins. There's some of that fluorite I talked about earlier. Uh, this is petrified wood. I sold that on my website a couple years ago, but I can't get it anymore. Uh, so there's there's all these different shaped, a lot of different shapes and sizes here on these rocks. And then this is a flake. Just a People that do flint napping often just throw off these flakes and throw them away. But actually a flake like this is almost more useful than a stone knife for cutting. So like I was saying about the thickness of the knife, you know, it's got a lot of thickness, but some of these flakes are um, relatively thin, you see. So um, if you can just find somebody that naps, they don't even have to make you a, a knife or an arrowhead. You know, see, I've got, I've got some big blades in here. Big old blade, kind of a arrowhead spear point thing, some more. Um, but almost more useful is just a nice big flake like this. So, I mean, you can almost do it with the stuff they throw away because this is just waste to those people. Okay. Everybody still hanging on here? Am I boring you to death? <laughs> uh, let's see. I've about gone through everything here. Uh, if you've got questions about how to make or get uh, tools, let me know. There are links down in the doobly-doo that I put in beforehand of where you can purchase polishing stones on my website. I sell polishing stones. I sell yucca leaves that you can make your own brushes from. Um, and I sell... Something else. Oh, uh, bits of scraps of buckskin. So I've got some, I've got some of those uh, buckskin scraps on my website too for smoothing rims. Um, I've got a link in the doobly doo for where you can get the gourds at the Wurtz Gourd Farm. So I don't sell these, 
I do have them on my website and then it says out of stock. So I'm waiting for my guy to send me more. I was making it myself, but it just became too much of a chore and it made me sick last year. I, well, I don't know. I got a sinus infection and there was some question whether I did it to myself from um, aerosolizing this gourd inside from, with a, a belt sander. So I just stopped doing it. Um, if I get more in stock, they will be on my website, but they aren't now. So, but you can order these gourds, and they're they're not hard to do, and you know it's a fun project. At least I think it's a fun project. So, um, there's that. What else did I not cover here? I mean, like I said, a lot of these things you can get, you know, at your local hobby store. You know, just clay working tools. Uh, pookies, pookies are the hard one. Pookies are the hard one because I I can't. If I was gonna make pookies and sell, it's just like the gourds. Scrapers. I just couldn't do it. I, I spend so much of my time filming and editing videos that I just don't have time for a lot of... I honestly don't make that much pottery. People say, oh, how much pottery do you make? I'm like, you know, I maybe make four or five pots a month. I'm, I'm not a productive, you know, really prolific potter because I'm busy making videos. And it's the same with these. They just take a lot of time. Um, but go down. You can take the lesson that I have on how to make your own. You can go to New Mexico Clay. That's also the link is in the doobly-doo for the New Mexico Clay. The thing they tell me about the New Mexico... I hadn't heard. Somebody said they bought one that was wonky. You might complain to them. The, the people that run New Mexico Clay are fairly nice people. So if, um, if... What I found is that a lot of times their website says they're out of stock on pookies. But I've been told that if you call them and say, Hey, I want a pookie, they will produce one for it because they make them in house that they will produce it for you so um you might if you look on the website and want one they don't have it you know give them a call and then if you get one that's wonky i mean you might complain they might replace it for you um it's been my experience that they're they're fairly um you know decent people who listen let's see where am i at here um i don't know All right, um, going back to the chat real quick. Granny Goose, when, I, when my wonkiness makes me sad, I just say to myself, Andy said to embrace the wonkiness. I, uh, yeah, yeah, you need a shirt, Granny Goose, that says, embrace the wonkiness. Everybody needs that reminder. It's, uh, it's not so bad. What year is considered ancient for pottery, Mrs. Dean Frame? Um, so, ancient, you know, if you look up ancient in the dictionary, it just, it just means old, you know, it, it just... It, there's not a specific time. So when I say ancient, I'm thinking of, um, you know, a long time, you know, a couple hundred years ago at least, back when, you know, before there were... In this area, you know, it's different in the New World. In, in Europe, I get a lot of people from Europe saying, oh, you know, ancient is back in Roman times or something. But uh, here in the Southwest, uh, it's not the case. It's just kind of old, so... Uh, <clears throat> it just depends. But yeah, it's it's not a specific time necessarily. It just means old. It just means what was done a long time ago. Uh, how much money does it take to get into pottery? Oh, <laughs> I've done videos on that Lunar Overdrive. Um, I have a couple of videos on you know how to get into pottery cheap and that kind of thing. Because what I'm teaching, because it's primitive pottery, you don't have to have a lot of stuff. You don't have to have a kiln and you don't have to have a wheel. Those, those are big investments you know, a slab roller. I show on my videos how to do it with just simple things. But I do say, you know, if, you follow, if you're following my instruction, you're going to need, a, you know, some kind of a scraper and some kind of a polishing stone. But you can, like I said, you can make your own from a gourd or a coconut shell. You can, you can use, instead of a, a purpose-made pookie like this, you can use a plastic bowl out of your kitchen, for example. So um, you, it doesn't take... Very, very little money to get into pottery. I can't say exactly how many dollars, but it, you, you don't, it doesn't take a large investment for sure. Flint flakes are so sharp, I'm sure they would be good for uh, to cut clay, especially if they're longer or larger flakes. Yeah, so that's what I was saying, Sarah, is that a lot of times you don't have to say, you don't have to go to a napper and go, can you make me a blade? I mean, that might be nice, but you can take what they're throwing away. Uh, just say, hey, can I get a couple flakes? And usually, they, you know, they're just throwing them in the garbage anyway. Uh, tree and flower. Hi, Andy. Have you ever heard of someone trying to reach ash glaze temps by firing pottery in a small clay furnace with air blowing into charcoal in the forge? Um, I think that's probably doable. Um, I don't know the exact temperature for ash glaze, but I think it's fairly low, like a thousand C. It's a little low for 
It's a little low for like an open outdoor firing like I do. But I think if you had a little, just a real primitive kiln uh, with some, maybe some forced air and stuff, you could reach those temps, I think. Uh, I don't have any experience with it. But I, I think you're on the right track. Granny Goose, no money needed if you are creative and can find local wild clay. Definitely, definitely. That's the thing about it is you don't have to invest a lot of money. Hi from New Zealand. Love your channel. I appreciate that, LFS. Darren Hollis, came across your bids a few days ago and I find them fascinating. Seems the algorithm is working in your favor. What is your favorite play, piece of pottery that you've made? Can you show us? Uh, probably my favorite piece that I've made is not here. I've sold it. <laughs> Uh, I'll show you something nice, though. Here. Let me... Uh, hold on a second. So this is... Um, this is my um, um, Dinwiddie Polychrome Bowl I made not too long ago. came out pretty good. It's all smudged on the inside, so that's just carbon. And then uh, polychrome on the outside, which means two or more colors. So it's red, white, and black. So that's a nice pot. I'm pretty proud of it. Um, and it is for sale on my website. If anybody's interested in buying a pot, this would be a nice gift. Um, what else do I have to cover today? What are we at here? Oh, let me go back over my, um, my notes here and remind you guys, because I know some of you people have come in late. Um, please don't forget to like uh, this video, because that will help me with the algorithm, okay? Uh, I've got a pottery kit giveaway. So this pottery kit right here, loaded with everything you're going to need to make pottery. It's got a, a pookie water bowl. It's got clay. It's got a gourd scraper. It's got a, a deer rib, piece of buckskin for smoothing. It's got a polishing stone, everything you need. Um, that's going to be given away on my next live stream, which is scheduled for March 9th. So if you're interested in that, show up there, and I will. it'll be a random drawing, okay? Um, my Southwest Potter's Gathering. That's April 5th, 6th, and 7th. Um, and anybody who is a channel supporter, that is a, a YouTube channel member, a patron, or Ancient Potter's Club member, is welcome to attend, no charge. Uh, fifth, the fifth is... Uh, we're going to go visit some ruins, some ancient ruins, and then we're going to look at some collections of ancient pottery. On the 6th, we're going to go around and collect clay all around southeast Arizona. On the 7th, we're going to some old abandoned mines to collect pigment minerals, mostly uh, iron oxide and uh, manganese dioxide. Okay? Uh, so that the link to that is in the doobly-doo as well if you're interested in learning more about that. Um, I currently have two openings in my spring pottery workshops. Uh, two people just canceled. Um, and so that is March 29th through April 2nd. That's a five-day intensive workshop where we camp out, we make pottery, we collect clay, we collect pigment minerals, we fire the whole ball of wax in five days. We also visit museums. We do everything. So um, that'll be a lot of fun. If you're interested in that, uh, the link to that is also down in the doobly-doo, okay? Uh, kind of sounds like Mark Hamill. Hmm. Uh, you know, I grew up. I grew up on Star Wars, so uh, that can only be a <clears throat> that can only be a um, you know a, a good thing in my mind. Uh, I was about what first grade when Star Wars came out, so that was a big deal to me. I saw that. I do like it so much. You need clay. My river is still frozen on the side. All right. Um, did I cover everything? You guys have questions because I think I went through all my tools here today. Uh, but if I forgot something, holler at me. Otherwise, I'm going to wrap it up. I looked everywhere for manganese dioxide and finally found a video on YouTube showing me how to get manganese. Oh, spent batteries. Oh, gosh. Be careful. Be careful. That uh, tearing up batter Opening up batteries sounds dangerous to me. Serving food out of a carbonized pot. Would the food be tainted at all? Do you think it would matter if you were cooking over a fire anyway? No. Um, this is just carbon, you know, right? Are we talking about, we're talking about smudged pottery, mm -hmm. right? have a carbonized pot. When you say carbonized pot, you're talking about like this black smudge. It's just carbon. It's not going to hurt you. I mean, it, yeah, it's perfectly safe. Um, and, and that's down in the clay, so I don't think you can like cook it out or anything. I think it's down, locked away in the clay, the way I understand it. I literally do all my pottery on the ground with my butt on a blanket and a little board in front of me with my clay on it. Two buckets, some rocks, and a butter knife. There you go. Yeah, that's as, as down to earth as you can get there, Granny. I cooked an ancient Hopi recipe over fire, and it was delicious. Oh, that's cool. I did, a, I did a video where I cooked some Hopi food over fire last year when I was up with uh, Chad Zuber. All right, then. I guess, uh, I guess we covered it. I appreciate you guys very much uh, showing up and hanging out with me. Have a great weekend.